Hi, I'm Carl Herzog, public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. And in case you haven't guessed, this is definitely not one of the USS Constitution's battles or a depiction of anything around that time period. Uh, this image is drawn from a tapestry depicting a Roman sea battle in the year 324. And as you can see, it was a pretty chaotic affair. Warfare at the time was just beginning its long, long evolution of adaption to the sea. And ships were seen sort of as just platforms for soldiers at the time. And they utilized a lot of the same tactics that were applied on land. The ships would be laden with soldiers and then simply rowed directly into each other where soldiers would board other ships colliding in ramming fashion and attempting to kill and take over on the other ships. There was no real great coordination among all of these ships. It was just a headlong charge into battle. A pretty messy affair, to say the least. <laughs> I think we often imagine that as soon as ships develop sails and large gunnery, the cannons, the naval artillery that we're used to thinking about, that instantly uh, tactics and ideas of how to organize the fleet suddenly sprung into being. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. From the time that sailing ships began to uh, go to war, driven largely by sail, instead of the oars that had preceded them, and even after uh, larger guns started being put on board, it still took a very long time for military leaders to begin to understand how to utilize uh, those assets, those ships, to the most effect uh, on the water. It was not something that everyone agreed upon, and there's a rich history of that evolution of how do you organize these ships and, and how do you get them to coordinate with each other. It's a process that the military today still refers to as command and control, or sometimes C3, command, control, and communication. As sailing ships grew larger and larger in uh, the 1600s and early 1700s, and as more and more guns got loaded onto those ships, there was a slow transition from the idea that every individual ship would charge into battle like they had with the Romans at 324, and instead that they would form a line of battle uh, so that they could all bring their broadside guns to bear on the enemy. But that wasn't necessarily an easy feat. It required not only individual seamanship in order to have this line of ships exist and, and keep from running over each other, but it also required a lot of communication and coordination if you wanted to be able to ensure that that line of ships that you as an admiral or commodore were in charge of was going to turn and, and, uh, and enter attack at the right times coordinated together. It definitely was not easy. Because of this, two different sort of theories evolved over the course of the 1700s, and one was the idea that a, a, a leader of a fleet could keep that fleet in the line through very distinct, clear communications. Now, keep in mind, of course, there was no radio at the time, so the only way that you could communicate from ship to ship was via visual signals or signal flags. But with a large fleet of 20 or more ships strung out along a line across the ocean, it could be miles between one ship, the ship at the front of the line and ships at the middle or even at the back of the line. And so the ability of all ships at once to see any particular flag signal was virtually impossible. And for a signal to get passed from ship to ship demanded that the signal be clearly understood and accurately translated and, and transmitted to the next set of ships down the line. And that didn't always happen either. In order to bypass all of these difficulties, there was another theory that said, if we can prepare the captains ahead of time with what the expectations are of what to do, then they are well trained enough to act without having to be given direct instructions for every step of the way via a signal flag set.
But that could create a, a fairly chaotic pell-mell situation too, in which it was even more difficult to sort of regain control once that chaos of battle had unfolded. Now these issues are associated with large fleet battles, and they're not something we usually spend a lot of time talking about with regard to Constitution, because as a frigate, Constitution was not part of a massive navy of ships of the line, and wasn't really involved in very many at all uh, major engagements with large fleets of ships that would have even formed a line to begin with. As we know, most of her famous battles were one-on-one -on -one ship duels, in which it was strictly a question of the captain of the ship maneuvering to take on a single enemy. However, toward the end of the War of 1812, in the waning days at the beginning of February of 1815, Commander Charles Stewart on board USS Constitution encountered two separate British ships at once and chose to engage them in battle. Now, even there, you would imagine that two single British ships could communicate with each other well enough to bring firepower against Constitution. But in the case of this battle with HMS Cyan and HMS Levant, Constitution was about equally on par with the combined gun factors or gunnery weight of the two smaller frigates, but they would have had or could have had an advantage against the single ship in terms of their ability to maneuver around and essentially surround Constitution or take on the ship in a way that Stuart would not have been able to respond to. However, that's not how it unfolded. After a very short battle, Constitution was able to defeat both of these ships, securing both of them as prizes, and once again being ready to sail and go into battle again in a short amount of time thereafter. It was a pretty amazing feat, not only of tactical prowess, but of seamanship and ship handling. And today, I thought we would hit my dining room table once again with our collection of small miniature ships and see if we can lay out and see how it was that Charles Stewart was able to take on these two ships and come out of it victorious. So let's see how that unfolded. So it was the afternoon of February 20th, 1815, when Stewart on Constitution first sights the first of the two British frigate sails. You can read about this in a transcription of Stewart's logbook, which is available on the USS Constitution Museum website. Uh, the page from the relevant battle is here, and you'll notice that it says uh, Tuesday, February 21st, because the day at sea began at noon, and so uh, noon on the 20th to noon on the 21st was actually considered the day of the 21st. But on a regular uh, shoreside calendar, this is uh, February 20th. So to display this battle, we're using 1 1200th scale miniatures. At this size, USS Constitution is about 2 inches long. We've used these miniatures in other videos, and if you'd like to learn more about them, you can follow the link on our YouTube notes for this episode. So beginning with the day at noon, uh, Constitution's log indicates that the ship was sailing at around 7 knots west-southwest uh, with the winds out of the northeast. At 1 p.m., the sail was sighted to the southward and westward. The ship hauled up for her and gave chase and set staysails, etc. At 1.15, made her out to be a large ship. At 1.30, they discovered another ship to the westward of her, both standing close hauled toward us under a press of sail with their starboard tacks on board. Beginning at 3 o'clock, Stuart notes that the two ships began making signals toward each other, and so he put on an entire press of sail to begin chasing down on them. In the logbook, it writes that they crowded all sail and chase, set the lower top mist to gallant uh, royal studding sails, at 4.15, the lord of the two ships tacked to the southward, but at 4.30, uh, Stuart notes that Constitution carried away their main royal mast. This is particularly worth noting because it's astonishing that uh, he had set all of the sail in an effort to chase, so much so that it actually broke off the upper section of the mainmast. At 5 o'clock, Constitution fired on the chase from the first gun of the 1st Division and the chase gun on the forecastle, uh, but their shot falling short, they ceased firing. 
The lee of the, the leeward of the two British ships then tacked back to the northward, and by 540, the two British ships had closed, passed within hail of each other, shortened sails, hauled up their courses, and appeared to be making preparations to receive constitution in battle. This is notable because it's the second effort that apparently the British ships were making to communicate with each other and devise a plan. By 555, the two British ships had shortened sail and formed on a line of the wind half a cable's length from each other. At 6 o'clock, both Constitution and the two British ships hoisted their ensigns, finally displaying exactly who they were. Uh, and at 650, uh, they were ranging within 300 yards upon the starboard side of the sternmost ship. In the logbook, Stuart writes that they invited the action by firing a shot between the two ships, which immediately commenced with an exchange of broadsides. It's here that the most pivotal point of the battle occurs. Enshrouded by smoke from the guns, Stuart's unable to clearly see what's happening in the light winds and the declining light of the day, and orders the crew to stop firing altogether. As the smoke cleared, Stuart found that the ship had uh, become abreast of the headmost ship, and so they gave her broadsides back the after yards, and closed with the sternmost ship under the cover of the smoke. Essentially, Stuart had ordered the crew to brace the yards around, backwinding all of the sails, and putting the ship into reverse so that he could prevent the sternmost ship from taking action. If the two British frigates had been planning on trying to encircle Constitution, the plan had clearly fallen apart as soon as Stuart had backed the sails, engaging one of the ships as the other one shot ahead. Seeing this, Stuart gave a broadside to the stern of HMS Levant, the fleeing ship, and at the same time seeing HMS Cyan wearing around, Constitution wore short around after her. It was shortly after this exchange that HMS Cyan struck her colors and surrendered. Coming within 50 yards of Cyan, Constitution then took possession of the ship, put 15 Marines over her prisoners, and gave her in charge to Lieutenant uh, Beekman Hoffman with a small crew. In less than an hour, Constitution had secured their prize, HMS Cyan, and the ship set forth to chase down Levant, the other ship that had fled. Fifteen minutes after doing that, they found a uh, discovered Levant, which had turned around after making, attempting to make their own repairs. And at 8.40, passing on opposite tacks, the two ships came uh, alongside each other, exchanged broadsides, Constitution wore under the stern of Levant, raked her, at which point Levant attempted to make all sail and run. Constitution opened fire with its chase guns, and very quickly Levant saw that escape was impossible, and they too struck their colors. The last line of Stewart's account in the logbook indicates that at 11 all hands are employed, repairing damages, securing prisoners, etc., etc., at 1 a.m. the ship was put in good fighting condition. It was a pretty astonishing feat altogether. In less than 12 hours from the time he first sighted the two ships, Stuart had not only engaged them, taken both of them as prizes, secured them, set aboard prize crews, but had his own ship repaired and ready to fight again. Stuart's victory against these two ships was the culmination of a very long and difficult cruise that had begun uh, more than a year earlier, and it wasn't over when the prizes were taken. A British squadron was still in pursuit, and Stuart was seeking to find a way that he could land the prisoners from the two ships, the imprisoned crew, British crew, and still get both of these prizes back to safety. Unfortunately, he wasn't successful in that. HMS Levant, which had become now the USS Levant, uh, was retaken by the British at a neutral Portuguese port, despite the protestations of the crew that it wasn't right. But Cyan did make it back to the States and continued to serve in the U.S. Navy afterwards. Despite the difficulty that Stuart had on this cruise before the battle as well as afterwards, it was an incredible feat of both seamanship and tactics. 
Charles Stewart's quick thinking in the midst of the battle to stop firing and then the crew's capability of immediately responding to his orders to back sails allowed Stewart the opportunity to gain the upper hand in what was very nearly a pretty disastrous situation or certainly could have turned out that way. Later on, when the two captains of the British ships were being held uh, on board Constitution, where they were treated as officers and welcome to dine with the rest of the officers, the two British captains fought with each other so bitterly over whose fault it was that they had lost that the American crew was losing respect for them, even as officers and gentlemen saying it was fairly dishonorable of them to be bickering in such a way uh, while on board. When Stewart did finally get back to the States, uh, he met the same hero's welcome that Bainbridge and Hull had received before him for another victory of Constitution. Although, unbeknownst to Stewart, the war was essentially over by the time that the battle had been won. So while it certainly didn't influence the outcome of the War of 1812, uh, Stewart's amazing success was the crowning touch for USS Constitution's victories throughout the war that secured her reputation and those of her captain and crew for the centuries to come. If you'd like to learn more about Stewart's uh, trials during this prolonged cruise, both before and after the battles with Cyan and Levant, you can find all kinds of details on the USS Constitution Museum website's uh, 1812 Cruises page, which is under the Discover and Learn History tab. Here we have interactive maps of all three of Constitution's major war cruises during 1812, uh, including Charles Stewart's uh, long passages back and forth around the Atlantic Ocean and his success with Cyan and Levant. The uh, interactive uh, maps will carry you through and you can see the various points and excerpts from the log in which Stewart discusses the difficulties he's having and we follow the ship across until the point where it, uh, it does uh, meet Cyan and Levant and come back to the United States. I hope this is an interesting look at some of the tactics that were in use uh, by multiple ships in battle with each other. Even though in this case it was only two ships, it demonstrates that communication was difficult and a, a astute captain willing to take a chance could, with a daring maneuver, could in fact defeat multiple ships that may otherwise have surrounded and defeated, uh, in this case, Constitution. If you have any questions about this or other topics, don't hesitate to post to any of the USS Constitution Museum social media. And as always, if you have other ideas for videos you'd like to see, don't hesitate to pass them on. Thanks a lot.